One of the most puzzling questions is how much refrigerant should be put in a refrigeration system when charging? There is no straightforward answer because all refrigeration systems differ in the amount of charge they hold. However, there are guidelines, charts, and techniques to use to correctly charge a system. In a system with a TXV, a receiver must be employed to act as a liquid refrigerant reservoir. When a TXV is throttled down, the receiver will contain more liquid. At a higher heat load, a TXV throttles open and draws liquid refrigerant from the receiver. It is of utmost importance to put a refrigeration system with a TXV metering device under a high load when charging with the refrigerant. High loads ensure that the TXV is fully open and delivering the maximum amount of refrigerant to the evaporator. At high loads, a sight glass located in the liquid line will bubble if the system is undercharged. If the TXV is throttled partly closed, the receiver has some liquid and the system is at a lower heat load, the sight glass may not bubble unless the system is severely undercharged. High loads can be achieved by placing a false heat load on the evaporator. Service technicians often confuse a bubbling sight glass with a low flow rate sight glass. A low flow rate sight glass only partially fills the volume of the sight glass but does not have refrigerant gas bubbles entrained in the flowing liquid. This may be seen when a system is charged correctly but experiences a very low heat load on the evaporator. This phenomenon is seen much more often in sight glasses in horizontal liquid lines than vertical liquid lines. Gravity will force the liquid in a vertical liquid line to settle at the lowest point and this can entirely fill a sight glass volume even at low flow rates. In the case of a bubbling sight glass, a technician must make sure that the liquid line is full of liquid before and after the sight glass. This can be done with an electronic sight glass which can determine whether there is vapor entrained in the liquid and can help a technician to ensure 100% liquid at the metering device. Electronic sight glasses can also be used on the evaporator outlet or start of the suction line to let the technician know if there is liquid entrained with the vapors. Apply these basic rules to make sure a TXV receiver sight glass refrigeration system is charged with the proper amount of refrigerant. 1. Always charge a TXV receiver sight glass system under a high load. It is preferable to charge refrigerant into the receiver if valving allows. Putting liquid refrigerant into the low side of the system can damage the compressor at startup and dilute the oil in the crankcase with refrigerant, causing oil flash and scored bearings. 2. Once liquid has been charged into the high side of the system and system pressures have equalized, let the system set idle for about 10 minutes. This helps vaporize any liquid the TXV has released into the evaporator while charging. After a 10 minute wait, start the system and monitor the amp draw. Keep the doors open and the system under a high load to allow the TXV to throttle open fully. This will draw a maximum amount of liquid from the receiver. Let the system run for a while at this high heat load to reach an equilibrium. If the sight glass bubbles, charge refrigerant vapor into the low side of the system until the sight glass stops bubbling. 3. Take evaporator superheat, compressor superheat, and condenser subcooling readings. If evaporator superheat settings are not within the guidelines, adjust the TXV superheat spring. Always give the TXV enough time to react to the change before taking the next reading. Make sure there is enough condenser subcooling to deliver a solid column of 100% liquid to the TXV. Also make sure that there is enough evaporator superheat to ensure that the compressor will not see any liquid refrigerant at lower loads. 4. Under high heat load, take evaporator superheat, compressor superheat, 
and condenser subcooling readings and compare them to the suggested guidelines. 5. Record the condensing and evaporating pressures of the system. Monitor the amp draw of the compressor with an ammeter and take a voltage reading at the compressor terminals. Compare the amp reading of the compressor to the manufacturer amp curves for the pressures recorded. Make sure the amp draw is within range on the curves for the two pressures and voltage recorded. Most capillary tube systems do not have sight glasses in their liquid lines. Capillary tube systems have fixed orifices which do not throttle open and closed like a TXV or AXV metering device, so a receiver is usually not needed. This is one reason why a capillary tube system is a critically charged system. Critically charged systems are systems that specify an exact amount of refrigerant charge, usually to the quarter ounce. The manufacturer nameplate will specify the critical charge. If the system has been running for some time and an undercharge is suddenly suspected, a leak probably exists. It is recommended procedure to leak check the system. Most capillary tube systems are small systems and it is good practice to recover, leak check, evacuate, and then critically charge the system. These procedures take very little time and eliminate guesswork as to whether the system has the right amount of charge. Once the desired vacuum is reached and the vacuum pump is isolated from the system, add the specified amount of liquid refrigerant to the high side of the refrigeration system through a gauge manifold. Adding this refrigerant can be done with a programmable electronic charging device or a critical charging cylinder designed for capillary tube systems. Once the critical amount of liquid refrigerant is charged into the system, let the liquid charge bleed from the high side of the system through the capillary tube. This will cause a good portion of the liquid to vaporize and end up in the evaporator as vapor. Evidence of this can be seen by letting the system idle for about 10 minutes after liquid charging to the high side. Within a minute, the low side pressure will gradually rise, demonstrating that the capillary tube is not plugged and that refrigerant is traveling through it. Once the low side pressure rises to equal the high side pressure, the system can be started. Once the system starts, take a compressor amp reading and measure voltage at the compressor terminals. Compare the amp reading to the manufacturer compressor curve or system curves to make sure the system is running as efficiently as possible. System performance curves are preferred in this case because compressor curves reveal only compressor performance, not system performance. If undercharged, add refrigerant vapor to the low side of the refrigeration system while it is running. A filter dryer change is always recommended before recharging a system. Often the replacement filter dryer will be larger than the original dryer. The larger dryer will hold more liquid refrigerant and the system may be a bit undercharged even if the nameplate charge is used. This is why it is important to use performance curves after charging. Charging an air conditioning comfort system is much different than charging a refrigeration system. Air conditioning systems rely on certain volumetric amounts of airflow referred to as cubic feet per minute across their evaporator coils. Air conditioning processes are both sensible and latent processes which take both heat and moisture from the air. Because of this, both wet bulb and dry bulb temperatures along with air flows and compressor superheats are needed to charge these systems. The most accurate method of charging a capillary tube or fixed orifice system is to weigh the charge into an empty system. However, time does not always allow recovering and evacuating before charging. The next most efficient and accurate way of charging a capillary tube system is to use a superheat charging table or curve. Charging by the compressor superheat method best balances the system's ability to absorb heat with the available heat load on the evaporator. Compressor superheat in these types of systems must be adjusted to meet the varying conditions of the air flowing over the condenser and evaporator coils. If this charging method is performed correctly, the system will work safely and efficiently at all conditions as long as the ambient is over 60 degrees Fahrenheit at the condenser. To use the superheat charging method, perform the following steps. 1. Make sure the evaporator has the rated CFM of airflow across its coil. Velometers and or manometers with proper equations will assist in calculating system CFM. Check to see if blower assemblies and coils are free of dirt and that the duct system is sized properly. 
Remember, the unit manufacturer controls condenser air volume by design, and the installer and designer control evaporator air volume. Fan speed must be adjusted to overcome design and installation variables to obtain 400 CFM per ton, plus or minus 10%. 2. Measure the compressor superheat at the compressor. 3. With the unit running and stabilized, measure condenser inlet air dry bulb temperature and evaporator inlet air wet bulb temperature. 4. Find the proper compressor superheat at the intersection of the dry bulb and wet bulb temperatures. 5. If the compressor superheat measured in step number 2 is too high, refrigerant must be added. If the compressor superheat is too low, refrigerant must be recovered from the system. Manufacturers may vary the style of superheat charging curves they offer. However, the same underlying principle holds for all tables and curves. The steps to charge a system according to the curve shown are as follows. 1. Measure indoor dry bulb temperature. This is the return air temperature at the air handler. 2. Measure outdoor dry bulb temperature at outdoor unit. This is the air temperature at the condenser. 3. Measure suction pressure at the compressor and convert it to a temperature using a pressure temperature chart. 4. Measure compressor temperature on the suction line near the compressor. 5. Calculate the amount of compressor superheat. 6. Find the intersection where the outdoor temperature and indoor temperature meet and read compressor superheat. If the compressor superheat of the system is more than 5 degrees Fahrenheit above what the chart reads, add refrigerant vapor into the low side of the operating system until the superheat is within 5 degrees of the chart. If the compressor superheat of the system is more than 5 degrees Fahrenheit below what the chart reads, recover refrigerant until the superheat is within 5 degrees of the chart. The theory behind superheat tables and curves is simple. Notice in the superheat charging curve that when moving to the right on the bottom axis, the outdoor temperature rises. For a constant indoor dry bulb or wet bulb temperature, as the outdoor ambient increases, superheat decreases. The reason for this is there is more head pressure pushing the subcooled liquid out of the condenser bottom through the liquid line and the capillary tube. This forces more refrigerant into the evaporator and gives less superheat which is why some systems flood and slug liquid at hot outdoor ambience when they are overcharged. The superheat curve prevents this from occurring if followed properly. If the outdoor temperature stays constant and the indoor dry bulb or wet bulb temperature increases, the operating superheat will increase. This loading of the indoor coil with sensible heat, latent heat, or both will cause a more rapid vaporization of refrigerant in the evaporator causing high compressor superheats. This is a normal occurrence. Many technicians will add refrigerant in this case and overcharge the system. It is completely normal for a capillary or fixed orifice metering device system to run high superheat at high evaporator loads. Technicians are often hesitant to measure and use wet bulb temperatures when working on air conditioning systems. However, it is very important to get these measurements when in the field. Wet bulb temperature gives an indication of both the latent and sensible heat loads on the coil. With both a dry bulb and wet bulb temperature, a technician may obtain the relative humidity of the air. When charging capillary tube and fixed orifice air conditioning systems, consult with the manufacturer of the air conditioning system and use their exact method of charging. Some manufacturers use different curves and tables for different models of their equipment. Some manufacturers use a slide rule superheating charging calculator. Other manufacturers have eliminated the need for a wet bulb temperature because of custom-made charging curves that represent their laboratory tests on the equipment.